as they turn for home, three sixteenths of a mile to run. Brody's cause still has about 12 lengths to make up. Lannery swings him to the outside, but he's still far back. A furlong to run. These two will dispute it. Dustin on the outside. Outwork is there toward the game, and they're locked in battle down to the wire. It's Dustin on the outside. He's going to better the two. Dustin, Outwork, very gamely for second. Five lengths farther back. Star Hill third. Rafting was fourth. Brody's cause off the board as the favorite. Welcome to the Paddock Pass with Brian Mariano on 104.5 The Team. Boy, what a weekend in horse racing. What a weekend in our bracket. Welcome to the Paddock Pass. I'm your host, Brian Mariano, and I am just shocked. I am shocked by a few outcomes this weekend. We had two huge upsets in both prep races for the Kentucky Derby this weekend, one in the Tampa Bay Derby, one in the San Felipe at Santa Anita. We'll get to those. Next week is the Dubai World Cup. We will get into that as well. Producer Guys is going to join us from Providence, and we'll go over the results from the first round of voting of the Bracketology Bracket. And, of course, we will give you selections for any races this weekend, including the Rebel Stakes at Oaklawn Park. Welcome, everyone, to the Paddock Pass this weekend. I was away with a few friends. We we took a shot at the pick six at Gulfstream Park, and unfortunately, we did not hit it. We didn't have the 30 to one. We were three for three the first three races. Unfortunately, didn't have the 30 to one. So, of course, I threw away the ticket. But, of course, I had money left in the bankroll to play these prep races. And like I told you last week, I really felt that Brody's cause would have shown up this week. I felt that the pace was there. Brody's cause will be able to close into it. And then, of course, I'm watching the race, and I turn to a buddy of mine, and I go, why is Corey Lannery so far back? Now, I understand this horse likes to come from off the pace and likes to make a big run, but I was feeling as if I was watching the Breeders' Cup from years ago with Mike Smith having Zenyatta almost 20 lengths back. Now, Tampa's a speed-favoring track. I understand that. But even then, that's the difference in the riders where Castellano knew what he had in Destin and just sat off the pace while Lannery was 12, 15 lengths back, even hitting the top of the stretch, and Tampa doesn't really have a long stretch. So I don't know what Corey Lannery was waiting for, but you cannot have the best horse in the race that far back going into the far turn. I understand he has a late kick, but for God's sakes, you got to give the horse a chance, and I really didn't feel like Corey Lannery gave him a chance at all. Big props to Destin and the connections there. Javier Castellano showing why he's one of the best riders in the United States and maybe in, in the entire world. Well, let me know out there. Let me know what you feel about the ride there. If you watched the race, if you gambled on the race, did you have the winner? And if you did, kudos to you because I did not. And let me know, am I crazy for feeling Corey Lannery was just absolutely awful at riding this horse? Maybe we, Maybe the connection should look elsewhere in future races because I really don't think I'm not a big fan of deep closers in the Kentucky Derby anyway you know of course you have your mind that bird which was a great ride by Calvin Burrell a few other horses that have come from off the pace but I like horses that are going to be really close and I'm going to move and I'll segue right into the San Felipe that was run later that night in Santa Anita and another big upset dancing candy taking down the San Felipe stakes and that was just a great ride by the aforementioned Mike Smith where the horse just took the lead and said, come and catch me. I have the best horse. Mike Smith felt he had the best horse, put him on the lead and said, come and catch me. Now, I felt that more spirit ran really well. Gary Stevens just really couldn't get up in the last strides. I believe the length of margin was around two or three lengths, but uh, the horses I thought would be there were there. More Spirit was there. Exaggerator was there. I was expecting more from I Will Score, Jerry Hollendorfer. I'm not really sure what they're going to do with that horse after this. But I was surprised that Dan's and Candy really set the pace and drew away. That was very impressive. A horse that you might be able to look at to set the early pace in May at the Kentucky Derby. And could be a horse that you could throw on tickets for, you know, trifectas, exactas. I wouldn't really put him up in chances of winning the race quite yet, but is definitely in the conversation after that impressive victory on Saturday. This, of course, is the Paddock Pass. I am your host, Brian Mariano. And we're going to look at which is the 
richest day in racing coming up next week, the Dubai World Cup. We have five American horses, five going over to try and take on the $10 million prize in the Dubai World Cup. There's been a field of 13 announced that was just announced earlier this week. The final entries will be put in on Monday at 9 a.m. And, of course, you have your likely favorite, California Chrome, who won his handicap race earlier last month. You have Frosted, who also won his prep race and actually worked a really nice work of five furlongs and 101 and three last Wednesday. He's going to be one to look at. He's going to be ones on my tickets. I'm sure he's probably going to be four to one, five to one. But, hey, 10 or $12 on a winner, I'll take it. Keen Ice who didn't really show up at all in his prep race, is expected to run as well. And we'll find out if the connections can get him going. And of course, M. Shawish is coming over the Don Handicap winner, arrived in Dubai earlier this week. He will be running as well, as of course will the San Antonio Stakes winner, Hopportunity. All of these horses, American, ready to take on the best in the $10 million Dubai World Cup. I'm going to wait to have my selections. Follow me on Twitter at 1045 Mariano. I will be tweeting that morning all my selections. Follow me out there, and hopefully we can get a few winners. I'm ready for that day. It's one of the best days in racing. We will have the UAE Derby, which is earlier in that card. That will bring, of course, the winner in the first Saturday in May for the Kentucky Derby. And I hope you guys play this card. Now, Dubai does a great job of putting this card together. There's a $2 million, six furlong, golden Shahi stakes that it has featuring XY Jet, who just won at Gulfstream Park a few weeks ago. You're going to have the $6 million Dubai Turf, which is always a great race. You're going to have two Americans and the $1 million Al Kois Sprint, who are the one-two finishers from the Turf Sprint back in Keeneland in October, which was Mongolian Saturday and Lady Shipman. So there's always great racing at Dubai. I hope you can take Thursday morning off, play horses in the morning, get ready, play some college basketball later that day, and we'll put some money into that bank account. Of course, this is the Paddock Pass. I'm your host, Brian Mariano, and we look forward to this weekend's Rebel Stakes where I give it. I give Oakland credit. They put together a fantastic card this weekend. This race in particular is very tough. It's not like last year's edition where we all had American Pharaoh penciled in this horse is going to be the winner if you look at this race we got a field we have a field of 14 scheduled to go with of course we have the entry one on one a and the two and two x as well we'll see if there's any scratches as we move on but this race is going to be very interesting and this is where you could look at a prep race like this that could bring out a big upset winner possibly in the first saturday in may we look at the 12 sudden breaking news this is the horse that everybody's looking at coming into this race i really feel like the post is going to hurt here even though many people disagree with me a lot of people feel as if the 14 post isn't going to hurt this horse at all i feel like a young horse being hung out that wide I think it's going to present some problems i'm not saying he can't win i'm just saying it's going to present some issues for a horse this young. And as I said earlier on the show, I'm not really a fan of horses that come flying from late, especially when it comes to the first Saturday in May. I want horses that are going to be close to the lead and then be able to pounce. Interesting horse I'm going to point out here is the number three, Rallis, for Doug O'Neill and Mario Gutierrez. I watched this horse run last summer at Saratoga, and it felt like the ship east wasn't really what the horse was ready for, and I feel like the horse needed to grow up a bit. And I think this horse can make a run on Saturday. You're going to get at least eight to one, maybe higher. So I would look at the number three, Rallis, as a possible opportunity here to make some extra money. This is a wide open race. If I'm playing it in exactas or triples, I obviously would include the entry, the one and one A, the Steve Asmussen entry. I would, of course, add this, I would add the number 10, Whitmore, what I read, Ortiz Jr. as well. Those are all horses to play, so I'd play a dollar exact a box, 1, 3, 10, 12, see if the three rallies can show up and get us a price, and maybe we can make some extra dough to come back and play next week on Dubai World Cup night. 104.5 The Team, 104.5theteam.com. This is the Paddock Pass, of course. I'm your host, Brian Mariano, and joining us now from Providence is Producer Gaz. Producer Gaz, how's uh, Providence treating you there, buddy? It's all, it's all right, man. It's not too bad. The weather's just fine. It's cleaning out, so Providence is okay. I miss you guys back in 518, but Providence is all right this weekend. 
Oh, I mean, you can't be too bad sitting there watching some good college basketball, so we don't feel too bad for you. <laughs> the games are great. Uh, more good games to come. And yeah, it's been, it's been March Madness is the best. It really is. Nothing wrong with that. So we're going to move on to our bracket that we started last week, and I'm going to go through them with you, see if you felt any surprises and how you feel about some of the matchups. Uh, if we start off with the 1-8 matchup between Secretary and Wise Dan, Secretary wins that one 77% to 23%. I don't know if you're really surprised by this, but was the margin surprising for you? Yes, definitely. I thought it was going to be like a 90 to 100%. I'm interested to see who is the 23% of people that went up against Secretariat and voted against them. I don't know if this was a situation where fans and listeners wanted to see a potential 16 over one seed because we never see it in the actual NCAA tournament. Some people maybe wanted to throw off our bracket, but yeah, just only winning by about 54% by Secretary definitely surprised me because I thought that was going to be the biggest blow of any matchup we had in this bracket. You know, I felt the same way. I went through it uh, this morning, and I was like, wow, I felt this matchup was much closer than I thought it'd be. I, and there was one that was 100% to zero, and I honestly thought this was going to be the one. And I found out the percentage this morning. I was just as shocked as you were. Yeah, and, and when we were going to get to 100% to 0% in a little bit, but yeah, I, I really want to, I wish we could ask the people, and maybe we'll, eventually those people will come out and say, here's why I voted against Secretariat, whether it was just to go after us and dig it up a little bit, or they actually had a legit argument because, yeah, well, I understand a good horse, but it's not better at Secretariat. And if you do, if you're one of those people out there in the 518 and you voted for Wise Dan, hit us up on Twitter. I'm at 104.5 Mariano. Hit Tom Goz out there. What is it again, guys? At Tom Goz, T-O-M-G-O-Z-Z. You can hit us up on Twitter or right on Facebook here. Comment below. Let us know. If you were one of the ones that went to Wise Dan, why? What were the reasons we're pretty shocked about it, but if you have some good reasons, hit us up on uh, social media, and we'll, of course, get back to you. We're going to move on to the 4-5 matchup in that side of the bracket, and it was Native Dancer, the 4-seed, versus the 5-seed Citation. And this one was a little closer, and we expected it to be, as we talked about last week, guys. And Native Dancer took it down 57% to 43%. Now, I'm not sure if you're surprised by this. I was a little bit, though. Yeah, it was kind of in the report. I thought, I thought Citation might pick up maybe another extra 10%, but the 4-5 or five matchup, going into it, we talked about that. that was one of our toughest matchups to decide which horse is better. It was actually one of our better uh, arguments on last week's edition of Paddock Podcast of which horse is going to come out top on this matchup. But overall, the 4-5 or five matchup, Native Dancer is going to walk it on and is going to have a tough matchup in that round of eight coming up. No, I agree. And I, as I went through these and, and went through some of the surprising outcomes, this one sort of surprised me in a way because I thought Citation's numbers would have really brought him over a little bit. But Native Dancer sure was good enough to win through here. We'll have a great matchup next week versus Secretariat. That should be a great one. I hope you guys keep voting out there in the 518. We're going to move on to the 3 6 matchup. That was Zenyatta, the 3 seed, versus the 6 seed, Seabiscuit. Now, I remember we talked about last week, guys. Maybe Seabiscuit would get a little love here because of the name and the movie. Many people, you know, older guys would know who Zenyatta was, but maybe a lot of the newer people of the sport couldn't. Were you surprised that Zenyatta took it down 64% to 36%? I was happy how this turned out. I know you're not supposed to have any a rooting interest in these. We're trying to look at these subjectively and make our picks, but I'm glad Zenyatta didn't get knocked off because of the popularity and all the fan support of Seabiscuit and the movie. If Seabiscuit had moved on over Zenyatta, it wouldn't have been a good move. It would have made sense to me. Zenyatta's just a flat better horse. She's had a great career. She's one of the most dominant horses that we've seen in the last 25 years. She's had an incredible resume. She's just flat out her resume up against Sea Biscuit. And it's good enough. Sea Biscuit is no bad horse. But when you look at the numbers, she's just better. And I'm glad here that the young moved on, that the popularity of Sea Biscuit wasn't the difference. When you look at the numbers, you look at the stats, and you know, she don't want that matchup, and she didn't, and it turned out that way. No, I agree with you completely. I was rooting for Zenyatta. I voted for Zenyatta, and she was definitely the superior horse here. But, of course, we did talk about it last week, and we were concerned most of the week that the popularity of Seabiscuit would have overcame this. And I'm really happy that it didn't skew who the best horse was. So we'll move on to the 2-7 matchup below there. And this was where we found our only 100% to 0% winner. And that was Spectacular Bid over Black Caviar. I know I mentioned it to you last week off the air that I was worried that many of the listeners wouldn't know who Black Caviar was. And I think this is where this number comes in. Do you agree with me? 
yeah, I'm leaning towards that way, but I'm also interested to see, I think when we look towards the next round here, this is the most intriguing horse spectacular bit because, yeah, it makes sense what you said. Maybe a lot of fans aren't used to or know a lot about Black Caveat, but the spectacular bit has a lot more fans, a lot more supporters than we realize. All of a sudden, spectacular bit is because of the dark horse in the field that the support around this horse, this might be a dark horse overall to win the whole tournament because of how much support it got in that first round. The Taylor Bitt's a good horse we touched on last week. If he didn't step on the tack before the race, it's a triple crown winning horse potentially. Mm-hmm. But spectacular bit, man. It, it, I, it, the, the potential of seeing that versus uh, Secretariat in the final four of his bracket and maybe he'll sit there with a the lack of support Secretariat pick up. The Taylor Bitt is a contender maybe to get all the way to the finals in this round. No, I definitely agree with you there, guys. I mean, th- this is definitely a dark horse, definitely a horse that is gaining, as we see from the first round of voting, that it could be a really popular pick here, which intrigues me for this weekend's matchup between Zenyatta and him because, you know, you're going to have a lot of voters that have seen Zenyatta and feel that she's one of the best Phillies that's ever run. And then against Spectacular Bid, where, of course, you had the unfortunate incident in the Belmont stepping on the tack. I'm interested to really see how this matchup comes down. I really feel like this is going to be close. Not sure how you feel, but I, I really feel like this 2-3 matchup is going to be, I'm going to see a 57-43 or maybe even a 51-49. It's going to be that close. This is a situation really just like when you're filling out your bracket in March Madness. Where you look at a team, and in this case, like a Zinniata, and you say, hey, I know when we break down the numbers that Zinniata should win this matchup. The stats overall are there. Things make sense. This should be a win for Zenyatta. But just like Mark Mendes, it comes down to kind of if they take the bits coming out into the game, if they take their bits picking up momentum, it seems as if in our situation, the fans, the people who vote on it, are going to lean towards they take the bits. So if I, if I had a vote, I would still vote Zenyatta. But overall, what do I think the final results could be? I think in our pool, they take their bits and that's off Zenyatta. Probably, you're saying right around a 10%, maybe margin of victory. I agree. It's definitely going to be an intriguing matchup. I can't wait to see how the numbers come out. And then you'll be back with us next week, of course, to yeah. recap all of this. I hope you're enjoying your time in Providence. We're going to move on to the other side of the bracket where the same 1-8 and eight matchup had the same type of percentages. Man of War, the 1 seed, versus the 8, Rachel Alexander, was 77% to 23% in favor of Man of War. Were you shocked to see that Rachel got this this much, or did you expect her to get more? How do you feel no, about this ma- outcome? I think this, this one comes down to timing a little bit. I think Man of War is just such an older force that maybe the, the nucleus, we'll call it, of the fan base voting for this, that really didn't need to watch Man or, or Run, didn't really know much about the horse. But they knew about Rachel Alexandra. They knew she was a dominant, silly, she ran great. <laughs> it's almost hysterical to watch her race in the Kentucky Oaks, how much she wins by in that race. Of course, with three minutes after Calvin Burrell hops off and it goes on her. The race <laughs> yeah. went there. People knew about her. She, she knew she was great. But how many knew about Man of War? That's why I think Rachel Alexander put so many votes here in that round. No, I would agree. She's definitely, you know, the, the fresher face between the two. There's no doubt about it. I mean, our the, our father's generation, some of the older generations will remember how great Man of War really was. But obviously, being the one seed, the numbers are there. So I think it was pretty logical that he got through here, but I was interested to see how you felt, you know, whether the percentages really fit, you know, what the numbers were saying. Yeah, I, if it was 85, 15, 90, 10, I thought I wanted to lean more towards, it was surprising a little bit. It's, yeah, I, I would have liked to see more closer towards 85, 50, but Rachel Alexander is a good horse, and I'm kind of glad there was a little intrigue on that match rather than our usual 116 matches we get in the NCAA tournament where it's close and half and it's a blowout by the end. Absolutely. So, guys, we're going to move on to the 4-5 matchup, and this was a number that really surprised me. And I don't know if I just messed up on the seeding here or I, I, I'm i not sure how exactly it played out, but the four-seed Seattle Slough beat Count Fleet, the number five seed, 92% to 8%. Now, I understand there's a little bit of disparity there, but this is a 4-5 matchup, guys. Why is it that we had a 92-8 to winner here? I don't know. <laughs> this is a blue deal bag. Because it's a 4-5, I don't play you for the season at all here because when you go through all these things, stack up one through 16, look at the resumes, 
seems to match up right around that even spot of Count Sleep and Seattle Swoop. Even, even when we did this discussion last week, I said, look, Count Sleep's a great horse. If 50% of the people would be 55% pick Count Sleep, that's actually a starting flat out. It, it was a tough decision for me. The reason I even decided to take Seattle Swoop is a little favoritism from the fact that my grandparents lost Seattle Swoop told me how, me about how great a horse Seattle Swoop was. So, I put a bit favoritism in this only pick. Sometimes they do practice. You pick your favorite team, you pick your favorite colors, and look at their own style. That's why I pick Seattle Slew here. But they have this big of a margin with the way. Well, I agree. Seattle Slew definitely should have been the winner, but the the margin just absolutely blew me away. I was shocked to see that. And, of course, we'll, we'll create another really good matchup in the next round in the Elite Eight where we have Man of War taking on Seattle Slew. I'm not sure how you feel about that, but I feel like this one's going to be – not as big of a blow away if a lot of people were supporting Seattle Slough in the first round. Right. That might be the most logical upset in the Elite Eight here we're looking at, that around the quarterfinals, if we call it, that Man War can get knocked off by Seattle Slough. Like you said, because of the percentage we're looking at, because of the small margin of victory, Man War won by in the Sweet 16, the opening round we had in our Seattle Slough, most likely horse here, lower seated, simple off an upset. All right, guys, we're going to move on here to the 3-6 matchup. And this was surprisingly our only upset of the first round. And the 6 seed affirmed took down the 3 seed Kelso 69% to 31%. Now, I'm not really sure if I'm surprised about the upset. I'm surprised that he almost got 70% of the vote. How do you feel? Yeah, same way. I looked at that race in the Travers race, of course, affirmed in Alidar ending in controversial fashion. Maybe some fans here in the 5 one eight. In the Campbell region, we're at, at Travers Staples, and I remember that great race between those two horses. I have a little bit of connection with that horse. I'm going to roll for him to move him on Kelso. Man, look at that through his stats last week. They're so impressive. What else could this horse have done throughout its career? And retired as one of the greatest horses of all time, sure. It's like any, like, I look at baseball players, too, in the sense that sometimes when a guy retires, it's 50, 60 years down the line, someone catches up to them. Doesn't make him a worse baseball player. It's not a great career. I thought Luke Kelso. Well, Kelso was great in his time with Graham. It just it caught up to it at time. But Kelso was a very good horse. But I think it's the, the favoritism of it here from how the Travers Stakes from 20 years ago last year got moved down. No, I agree with you. I think that a lot of people were remembering those great races that you referred to here in Saratoga. And, of course, the, the big upset of obviously having great races in the Triple Crown races. And, of course, mm-hmm. you, you mentioned that rivalry with Alidar. I'm not surprised, obviously, with the upset, but like we said, I'm surprised about the margin that it was at. We're going to move on to the 2-7 matchup here. Number two, American Pharaoh, was a winner over the number seven, Cigar, 57% to 43%. Now, remember we talked last week, guys, this was kind of the battle of the seasons. Who had a better season? Because obviously Cigar had a much longer career, but he had one of the great seasons in 95. American Pharaoh obviously having a great season last year. Were you surprised on how close this was? Yeah, I thought because of how recent the American Pharaoh triple crop year was that Pharaoh would blow away the field. And we were both there to watch Pharaoh run in that morning. The local support here in all things, the people showed the American Pharaoh. It was close, but overall, I think when we look at this next round coming up, this to me might be the biggest blowout of the round of eight matchups because of American Pharaoh and a firm team that jumped with each other, both triple crown winners, both lost it to Travis and they came down on the land. I think American Pharaoh is going to pull away from a firm here because the, the voters, I would assume, look at this and say, well, these are similar horses, they have similar popularity, they have similar resumes, but because Pharaoh was sooner, or excuse me, Pharaoh was more recent. I'm going to lean towards Farrell. So I think Farrell actually had a pretty decisive victory hole here over the firm because of the margin of time that it consumed since the firm actually ran Farrell's run. No, I think I'm going to agree with you here. I think of America Farrell. This is obviously a really good matchup, obviously both triple ground winners like you mentioned. And I do agree that the, the recency of it is probably going to give it a little more help to America Farrell. But I think the biggest thing that's going to help him is the fact that he was the first, and this is not to take away from a firm because obviously he didn't have a chance to run for a Breeders' Cup championship back when he was running. But that's a big deal that American Farrell is the mm-hmm. first horse to get to complete the Grand Slam. I think that's going to be one that's really going to push him over the edge. I think that's going to be the next step. And I, I'm looking for probably a 70 to 30, maybe even 75% to 25% here. 
I agree with you. I think you're right on the target with the percentages. So, of course, that's Producer Guys joining us from Providence. Producer Guys, I hope you're having a great time out there. I appreciate you joining us this week. Best of luck with all of your picks out in uh, in Providence, man. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. And hopefully uh, my picks here in your Petit Pass podcast, our Petit Pass podcast, are better than my bracket picks so far. <laughs> surviving through the first weekend guys i'm not really right. sure how we're gonna do next weekend but of course i got to be rooting for my duke blue devils you of course supporting your syracuse orange out there with probably a lot of the 518 so we'll see how they do this weekend as they progress i appreciate you joining me guys thanks man appreciate it oh, i guess it was a bad thing to put florida golf coast in my national championship right <laughs> is that not a good uh, I, I don't know. In Vegas, they had to be really good odds. I'm not really sure how that's going to work out for you now, but I don't know if they pay to lose, but we'll find out. All right, I'll see you next week. All right, there he goes, producer guys. I appreciate you joining us this week. Always love your insight. This, of course, is the Paddock Pass here. I'm your host, Brian Mariano. That's it for us this week. Make sure you vote this week. Love the feedback we're getting on the podcast. You guys are always pushing us, which helps us keep going. And let's see if we can get any more upsets. Maybe we could see a Zenyatta beat a spectacular bid or an affirmed beat an American Faro. You guys choose. We'll bring the results again next week. Hit us up on Twitter and Facebook. If you have a reason why you choose a specific horse, let us know. We can mention you on the show next week when we'll talk back and forth. Me and guys love hearing from you guys. So keep commenting. Keep hitting us on Twitter. Let us know how you feel, and we'll bring it up on the show next week. This, of course, is the Paddock Pass. I'm your host, Brian Mariano, and we'll make sure all your pick four tickets are winning ones.